Hi everyone, my name is Faith McGee and I have blonde hair and um, pretty fair skinned, especially since I live in Portland, Oregon. I'm wearing glasses today and I'm wearing my favorite leopard hoodie because it is very chilly in Portland, Oregon. Um, and uh, it's great to be here. So um, I'm here today with my co-speaker. Hi, everybody. My name's Natasha. I am a Southeast Asian woman with black hair. And I'm like Faith, I'm wearing my favorite t-shirt. It's white in color. And um, I'm currently in a room next to a window. And um, super excited to be here together with Faith to share what we've worked on so far. And I will now hand it over to Faith, who will tell you more about our presentation. Yes. So um, I was the quantitative research manager over um, at EA. I was on the XD team in IT. Um, and if, uh, let me just explain a little bit about EA or electronic arts for those who may not be um, big gamers. Um, we're one of the biggest gaming publishing companies in the world. Um, we produce such titles as FIFA, Apex, Plants vs. Zombies, and Madden. Uh, so run the gamut of a lot of different types of games. Uh, we have over uh, 20 studios and 52 offices all over the globe. So we um, interact and work with and collaborate with a lot of different folks all over the world. So for today's agenda, we're going to go through um, just talking about inclusivity and in games. What is it like? Who are uh, who's playing games? Um, what are some of the assumptions? Um, it, really important for research to always challenge assumptions. And so we're going to talk a little bit about those assumptions in the beginning. And then we're going to talk about how we as a group got started. Um, really, a lot of this presentation is um, going to hopefully em um, empower other groups to start inclusive research, inclusive design um, programs at their companies. So that's what we're really trying to focus on in this presentation. And um, Natasha is going to talk about all of the different projects that we've worked on, making those little one incremental increases count and really make impacts. Um, and then we're going to talk about the future of gaming. So the current state, um, it doesn't surprise a lot of people, but maybe it will, uh, that one in three people on the planet play video games. And um, that number has just increased um, completely because of the pandemic and just because um, more and more different types of folks are playing games. They're playing games on their mobile devices. Uh, you can have access to games almost anywhere you are in the world. So what a lot of people will assume is that the average gamer is 16 years old, which is not at all correct. Um, and it's important for us as researchers at EA to be able to understand who's playing our games. So um, you'll see that the average age is actually 34 years old for um, people who identify as male men and uh, 36 years old for people who identify as women. So um, the average gamer actually owns a house and has kids and maybe even a picket fence. Um, I'm a little joking about the other part, but um, when we start to really kind of think about this person, we want to kind of like think about, you know, how their world is and what their their day-to-day -day experience is like and what it's like to pick up a game to play you know fifa or mad um we'll see that uh, 45 percent of us gamers identify as women and that is a huge increase and it's increasing more and more um women are are playing games um some of the games um that you'll see a large demographic of women might be sims um we'll see that uh, 57 percent of video game players in the us um are between the ages of uh, 6 to 29. Um, and we also see that that in the next 10 years, we'll see that increase of, of people of color. 
So we see a lot of um, Black and Latinx youth um, in the US spend more time per day um, playing mobile games and console games than actually white youth, um, which may kind of like uh, challenge some people's assumptions about the typical gamer as being um, a 16 year old uh, white male playing games in their um, parents' basement. And we also see that people who make more than 90,000 are likely to purchase games. Um, and 9% compared to 12% of the population making 90% or 90K um, a year. So we're seeing that um, people who are um, uh, middle class and more affluent are those who are making those video game purchases. There are 46 million disabled gamers in the United States. Um, and the source is Able Gamers, which is a wonderful nonprofit for um, disabled gamers. So um, what does that really look like? So according to a 2020 International Game Developers Association survey, um, we're seeing that 29% uh, of respondents identified as having one or more disabilities versus the US population of 26%. So what that means is that um, gaming um, is something that is very attractive to those who are um, disabled and, the, and um, having one or more um, disabilities. So um, the breakdown is here, 15% uh, um, have a, um, a mental illness, 8% um, intellectual or learning disability, 7% physical, 5% neurological, 4% visual, and 2% hearing impairment. So why is this important? Again, this is so fundamental for like how we're making games, what games we're making, characters that we're putting in games. It is completely about looking at how uh, and what, uh, what types of uh, demographic populations are attracted and wanting to play games. So when we think about like, all right, we look and we see that there's a large percentage of um, people, underrepresented groups in the population, um, playing games, wanting to play games. Then we look at like, who are we employing? Who's part of our workforce? Because um, rather than, you know, the traditional design thinking of going to a population, finding out what their pain points are, and then going and creating a solution to impose on that population, we really want to work and partner with people in co-design. So it's more about designing with rather than four. And we look at our population and we see that, you know, one in four women um, have a disability. So we want to look at like, all right, well, how is our employee population representing um, folks that are from underrepresented groups? When we don't build products um, with um, folks from underrepresented groups, there is a big mismatch in what we deliver for those folks. So um, two in five disabled gamers have purchased games that they haven't been able to play um, due to the poor accessibility reasons. Um, and, you know, what we look at is like, okay, so now we're, we're, we're building products um, that are inaccessible for for folks who are um, who who want to be playing these games. It's not just a you know a moral issue. It's also a market issue. We're not reaching everyone in the market. We're not reaching the market potential. There's been a little bit of kind of an excuse that well, this the market doesn't want. Um, accessibility features. But we see in different types of games that people actually 
people who um, may not have a disability actually want to use some of these accessibility features. So um, we see that a, a third of players for Uncharted 4 use one-handed control option. We see 60% of players for Assassin's Creed um, turn on their subtitles. And then we also see that 95% of Assassin's Creed um, Odyssey players left their subtitles on. So what this tells us is not only is there a market for these accessibility features, but there's also like desire and appetite um, for folks that may not have a disability for these accessibility features. So the main takeaways from this is that um, hire from underrepresented groups. So your employee population matches your customer base. And again, this reason is so that you are designing products with underrepresented people, not for underrepresented people. Um, and part of that is because underrepresented people um, have lived lives of having to develop hacks around so many different things. They can bring that creativity, they can bring those ideas to product development that a lot of people wouldn't be able to bring that perspective. They're awesome. So leverage your employees to help making inclusive products. So look at um, folks that you do employ. Um, and we talk a little bit more about this, but this could be um, leveraging your employee resource group and finding um, folks who would uh, volunteer to help participate in um, user testing or co-creation studies, helping, helping um, shepherd um, products through the development process. And then figure out your cost, how your customers are using the product and use that insight to build on the product. So as we saw with some of the Assassin's Creed games, how do people wanna use some of these products? Should we start exploring more accessibility features because we're seeing an appetite grow for those products? Okay, so this, this is a lot about kind of who our customer is. And now we're gonna kind of go into like, a little bit more about what we did at EA. Um, but first, um, I wanna talk a little bit about what inclusive research is anyway. So um, inclusive research is, is not something that we made up. Um, inclusive research actually comes in a long line of different types of research methods. So um, when we look at like a timeline of different research methodologies, we see that, well, the survey has been around since 3200 BC. We see that Think Aloud, um, which is like a Think Aloud usability testing um, approach has been around since Sigmund Freud. Um, benchmarking has been around um, from surveying land. We see that A-B testing, something that a lot of like marketing groups will um, leverage, that's been around since the 1920s. So um, inclusive research has been around since 2001. It was coined by a researcher named Jan Wamsley, who was um, Australian, and it was originally used to describe a family um, of methods to research um, folks with learning and intellectual disabilities. Um, but today, inclusive research um, encompasses much more than just that. So um, what does it even mean to make um, a product inclusive? So um, I'm going to focus on digital um, products right now. Um, but this is, um, you could apply this to other experiences such as physical and person experiences. But um, for a digital product, it really starts with the code. The code is really like the DNA. Um, it is what will allow that product to be accessible to folks. Um, content that meets the needs of varying groups. So um, it could look like uh, form fields for like asking people demographic information. Um, it could be like how you, you word those form fields. What do you include in those fields as options for folks? Um, 
Also, it takes into consideration how your user is moving through life. So is your user someone who is walking down the street? Is your user someone who is driving a car? It really like looks at the experience um, through a contextual lens and sees like how that user is using your product. And then it looks at like what kinds of opportunities could be available to make that experience and that product more accessible. So is it like a dark mode? Is it, um, you know, having um, a, uh, an ability to change a preference because of a, a colorblind type? And then it also um, keeps into um, account like uh, the tolerance for error. So you want to maximize tolerance for error, making sure that folks can make a mistake and be able to easily go back um, without creating a huge hardship in the digital experience. So um, you you would not want to go and say, I'm going to make an inclusive uh, product because um, that will be very difficult without having an inclusive workplace. Again, like I mentioned, it's important to be able to hire from underrepresented groups to be able to create an inclusive workplace. So first of all, is just looking at your workplace and making it more inclusive. Um, the beginning of that is, of course, looking at like what you use as an enterprise, like looking at your enterprise software tools. Um, are they can are they accessible to everyone? Um, are you using an enterprise vendor, software vendor that uh, creates a product that is inaccessible? Well, that is uh, not conducive to creating an equitable um, workplace. So you would want to start off with an audit and looking at that, and then going into a diverse hiring. Um, hiring from these underrepresented groups, bringing in those diverse perspectives, and then of course creating those. Um, inclusive products. Okay, um, and so I am going to leave the the nitty gritty details over to Natasha to talk a little bit how, about how we started the revolution at EA. Thanks, Faith. So. When we started from, we started with a lot of passion and very little money, <laughs> but it was enough to produce a scalable strategy for making an impact on game development. So the first thing that you want to assess is assess and, oh, sorry, um, next slide, please. So the first thing that you would like to assess is assess where you are starting from. If we go to the next slide, um, we have this inclusivity maturity model, which would uh, determine where your team or your you know, particular organization is at. Um, so Faith actually did this and she did such a great job in doing it that I would actually leave it up to her <laughs> to bring you through this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is um, very similar for folks that are in the UX world. This is very similar to the UX maturity model, um, except it is for inclusivity. So um, at the very kind of like unrecognized, the, 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 the most immature level, it's unrecognized and it's not considered important in your product development life cycle. Um, and this is for companies who think of uh, diversity and inclusion as more of an HR issue and not thinking about it at a product level. Um, and then the next level up is like the interested. So this is like ad hoc implementation. This is for folks who are kind of thinking about accessibility, um, interested in maybe best practices, but don't have like a formal process set up for evaluating their products or uh, auditing their products and seeing just how accessible they are or how they conform to guidelines. Um, then the next level up is invested. So this is where you are starting to believe like that it is important to start to invest in this um, in accessibility and in, in, in 
inclusive research. Um, so this is when you start to see more formalized programs start to roll out. You start to see a lot of um, collaboration between the design team and engineering team um, around what accessibility is, what accessibility, what is good for accessibility for that company. Um, and then that goes to the committed. And this is when you start getting the uh, more senior and um, executive stakeholders involved. Um, and this is where you really start to see like lines in the sand where people um, believe that they need to really focus on making inclusive um, products that go beyond um, uh, an accessibility checklist. Um, engaged. Um, is where you start seeing that it is one of the core tenants of the organization. And then you start seeing a lot of like C-level um, support and input for this. And then of course, embedded is where it is embedded in every part of the organization um, that it you can see by the product's flexibility and resiliency, how the products are um, changing and conforming to the needs of the um, population by um, these products, um, taking the feedback from customers, looking at the market, and then um, being able to understand how the product can better meet these needs um, through an inclusive research lens. So, um, and um, I can go hand it off to Natasha at this point. Thank you, Faith. That was, um, that was super amazing. I am really enamored with that model that you made. So um, we found that 26% of US adults have a disability. And in 2020, 6.1% of Microsoft and Google employees self-identified as disabled and 3.9% at Facebook or now called Meta also self-identified as disabled according to Fast Company. So I think we should not be explorers in our customers and employees' lives. They should be a part of the product development process in each phase. Building for accessibility means hiring and designing with instead of for the underrepresented groups. Do you mind going to the next slide, please? So similarly, in a poll, a Twitter poll conducted by Aaron Chu of Fast Company, people were asked this question. If you are a disabled person or in the roles in the downstream of product lifecycle, you know, for example, customer service, QAs, do you feel you have enough decision-making power to change the product you deliver? Sadly, everyone overwhelmingly voted no. So it is imperative for underrepresented groups to be with us as part of the product development process in each of the life cycle, product lifecycle phase. Could we go to the next? Thank you. So the next step we recommend for a successful inclusive research and products journey is to start with your team or build a group. Moving on. Um, so to influence people, the team need to be clear on the mission. So we need to get that elevator pitch down. We need to start with a team charter that people on the team feel at least 80% about and can be memorized. So that team, team charter is your sales pitch. It's about the team and what you do and don't do. So you're going to use this to gain support for investments in inclusive research at your company. If your company is as big as ours at EA, you will want consistency. Everyone on the team should be able to share the same message, the same stories, no matter who they talk to. One of the things that we found really essential, especially you know, at EA, was being able to build an army of advocates across all levels and across the company and connect with them through our story. So in reality, only 5% of people remember statistics after they're shared. Also, our average attention span is only eight seconds. So offer stories that will resonate with your different audiences 
tailor your group story to the discipline or group you're talking to and be clear of, on the mission, especially what you want people to do after you tell your story. What is it that you want them to do for you? Also important to remember is that you are not alone. This is not a job that you can do all alone. So for us, we are pretty lucky that we are situation, situated quite strategically. So the function where we are at at EA, we interact and collaborate with like different folks all over the world. And um, my role in looking after research for both player and ex employee experience also help with that as well. So having that advocates at all levels and across companies are definitely helpful in affecting progress, no matter how small they are. If we, so the next slide, we talk about turning the workplace into a place where we can make the underrepresented groups thrive. Um, often we hear, uh, you know, certain companies saying, oh, we're very inclusive, but what does that mean? Um, does that mean we're, you know, opening in uh, the doors and inviting them in or, but, you know, just like what Faith said earlier, we can't change our workforce until we change our tools to be in line with inclusive design. So at EA, we found success through advocating underrepresented groups, which made accessibility needs a requirement for all new vendor procurement. On the slide, um, we have two bar charts that share a state of disability survey run by Mercer, an asset management firm. The results show about 70% of employees with disabilities feel that the company they work for creates an environment where people with diverse backgrounds can succeed, compared to 85% all other employees. The survey also showed that about 55% employees with disabilities feel that they are appropriately involved in decisions about their work, compared to 65% of all other employees. So to move the needle towards inclusivity, what research can do to make sure the underrepresented can thrive is to partner with IT and HR, the two groups that touch all parts of the company. We can quantify employee needs, and you, know, you can do this by running a quick study with IT and HR. Um, prioritize technology needs. Uh, you know, all our employees use technology in some ways or another. For us, the quickest win is to implement those tech needs. And lastly, advocate for using vendors who are WCAG 2.1 AA compliant. I always call, you know, pronounce it as WCAG, but some people refer to them as WCAG. Cool. The other thing that we could do is we can leverage design systems. So your company may be using a design system or a component library. So by advocating for the system to follow accessibility standards, you're opening jobs to not only build the product, but for more customers and employees to be able to use it. Um, if you are unfamiliar with what a design system is, it is a collection of repeatable components and a set of standards that guide the use of those components. So companies usually use design systems across all products to scale and be more efficient in product development. Um, very interesting number from Forbes, 68% um, of companies use a design system to build digital products. So in our group, we made sure that our design system not only meets the accessibility standards, we also consider people who are neurodivergent and speak English as a second language while recommending design iterations. It's also important to get training to all areas of the company. You can consider a hybrid approach, which is grassroots and also top down. So by grassroots, I mean leveraging employee resource groups if your company have them to help share their pers perspective across the organization. So chances are, these are there are great, great folks who would love to share more about disability culture and be part of the design process. Top down, what I mean by top down is you can align with human resources to find out their main objectives and how your team can support company-wide diversity and inclusion programs. Um, according to Mercer, less than 5% of companies investigate the employee experience of those with disabilities. 
So it is now more important than ever for us to advocate and connect with all the areas of the company. To sum it all up, our takeaways are firstly, audit your employee tools and advocate for using enterprise tools that are WCAG 2.1 compliant and or look for ways to strongly influence vendors' roadmaps if they are not as far along in their accessibility journey. Secondly, find out how your product is being built. Leverage design systems to be accessible and inclusive. And thirdly, advocate for training for all areas of the company by leveraging ERG groups and also HR programs. So the best learning that we've gained in this journey is persistent and consistency matters. That 1% wins that we've collected throughout this journey consistently will eventually add up to something big. Nudging everyone along an inclusive workplace and influencing adoption for inclusive products take a really, really long time. So prepare for the long haul and always, always celebrate the small wins. So some of the small wins that we had um, for the work that we did with FIFA, we shared with key leadership the difficulties that gamers with disabilities have while using EA's connectivity tool for understanding their connection issues. So we arm ourselves with emotional stories to that meeting. Leadership was moved to quickly put our accessibility recommendation in the following sprints. For EA Play, which is a yearly event that EA put together. We partnered with our accessibility director to map out the customer journey for people with disabilities coming to EA events. We were able to get buy-in after socializing journey maps and make the registration process accessible and help make major improvements to reduce friction at state events. We also work with our design partners to improve the design library. So our partners include the centralized EA brand team who have made inclusive design a top priority. We've been working closely with them to build like branding guidelines and component library that is flexible enough to be used across both employee and play experiences that is accessible and also user-friendly. The next small win we have is research repository. So we, in research repository, we highlight educational and best practices for inclusive design. We also share these through meetings and workshops. We are proud to partner with a diverse team that don't represent the dominant culture, people who are disabled, people of color, and non-native English speaking during implementation. For the work with vendors that are not compliant with WCAG, we influence them to include accessibility into their product launch roadmaps. Some even moved up the launch of accessible features by several quarters. We found success during vendor assessments by including inclusive design framework as a criteria for vendor selection. So the reality is that the future of gaming has already happened at scale. Inclusivity is top of mind in 2021. So 2020 was a big year for all of us. And while we have lost a lot, we have also gained new perspective. So the unifying cultural experiences of COVID-19, Black Lives Matter, and Stop Asian Hate Movements force all of us to take a hard and long look at how we currently address the needs of the people. And not just some people, it's like everyone just as everyone is affected by the losses incurred during the last two years and inequities that exposed in the system meant to serve us. Several companies are moving forward to diversify their employees. So as an example, VMware created a neurodiversity inclusion program, which considers the outreach and hiring processes for people who are neuro neurodivergent to help remove friction and ensure support and mentorship is available. In 2020, Starbucks opened its first inclusive design cafe in Korea. In this cafe, 
not only the store and layout are designed for people with disabilities, Starbucks also trained baristas in basic expressions in the Korean Sign Language. We also have leading tech companies such as Etsy, Google, and Salesforce who are hiring for inclusive design specific research and design and product roles. So TechCrunch predicts that in less than 10 years, 57% of video game players in the US between the ages of six and 29 will be people of color. So where is the gaming industry headed? Um, you know, there will be more investment in content for games because female gamers purchase more microtransactions and other add-ons. This is likely due in part to their interest in brands offering customized and personalized products. There will also be more games that appeal to older audiences, um, according to Global Web Index from 2018 to 2020. There has been a 32% increase in players between the ages of 50 to 64. So the industry needs to create a bridge to connect underrepresented talent and leadership to opportunities. Right, the pipeline of underrepresented group is there. In 2014, top universities were graduating Black and Latinx computer engineering and engineering students at twice the rate that leading tech companies were hiring them, according to a Tolby survey. Recently, seven Silicon Valley companies released their employee numbers, and on average, just 2% of technology workers are Black, 3% are Hispanic. But the good news is, last year, 4.5% um, of new recipients of bachelor's degree in computer science or computer engineering were African American, and 6.5% were Hispanic, according to uh, the data from computer Computing Research Association. So the bridge is what everyone takes to get the position, but in this case, it's examining the hiring process for biases and friction for underrepresented groups. But what is it that is there once they take this bridge? What kind of environment is there for them to thrive? We found um, some bridges that is already in the community. Black Gaming created a program by Meta an initiative announced in December that supports the Black gaming community through 10 million in funding. The two-year program aims to equip the next generation of Black gaming creators with partnership status, mentorship, training on the platform, and more. Similarly, EA also offers software engineering virtual experience program in collaboration with Forage. This virtual experience program is complementary for all students. Um, who will experience what life is as a software engineer at EA. The goal is for them to feel empowered from the beginning with key insights into what lies ahead in their career at EA. So please check out, um, I think that is the end of our presentation. Please check out our inclusive research playbook, which is linked in this slide. Um, this presentation is available in the event page. So Grace, I think we're ready for some questions. All right, let's get into it. And great presentation, Natasha and Faith, thank you. Okay, uh, first question here from Abigail uh, is about addressing a common misconception. So the question asks, why do you think people misunderstand that accessibility in games isn't just making an easy mode. Nat, do you want to take that or I can take that? Go ahead, I'll chime in. Um, so I think it all comes down to that um, there hasn't been enough like customer research in um, in who's playing these games. And there hasn't been a lot of research into um, really like what types of um, accessibility, accessibility features people may want. Um, and so um, because there's 
a lot of gaming and not just like at EA, but at other gaming um, publishing companies is a lot of evaluative work where they are um, conducting a lot of research about um, how the game is being played uh, right before launch. Um, there are, there's more interest in generative research so research into kind of like what more like opportunities what the opportunity space is what is the opportunity space for all of these different modes and all of these different ways of playing games so i think it's slowly getting there but i um so i think historically it's been a lot of focus on uh, that evaluative research uh, right before launch, rather than that generative research of like really getting to understand like what the customer needs are and how they're using the product. But um, Nat, what do you, what do you, what would you say? Um, I agree with you, and maybe for me to add on, it's it's really sad. I think that not a lot of people are aware of accessibility as a concept. Um, there is this morning I attended a um, talk by Gareth about how how can we measure the impact on accessibility, and he he put it put it more eloquently than I did than I can. It's more about like there's this misperception about accessibility as compliance, whereas in design, accessibility is about measuring or providing a good experience for everybody. So there's not been a lot of research, like Faith said, and there's not been a lot of um, time and effort spent on education about all of this. So hopefully we're getting there. So hopefully, you know, with, you know, conferences such as, you know, XCon and a lot more and more of us are aware of it hopefully we can bring this forward to like a better progression and to like you know a lot more progression than we want it to be or then to a lot more progression to what we want it to be than versus what we have right now absolutely thank you so sort of on a similar note um this person asks, how does electronic arts distinguish between inclusive design and making video games accessible? That's a great question. <laughs> um, Faith, feel free to chime in. So within electronic arts, there's a lot of um, organizations that don't only produce games. So what I would say that for our group, because we work in uh, EA technology, what we do is inclusive design, whereas inclusive game design is slightly different from what we do. So it all comes down to different disciplines of design working for the same company. Right, there, um, and this is Faith, there is, um, in marketing, they have, um, a group that is like inclusivity in games and that is making sure that the characters um, are more representative of um, our culture and they're um, using um, characters that are from underrepresented groups that are depicted um, in a way that is more of real life than um, I think some historically, um, some underrepresented groups in gaming have been kind of distorted in their, um, in their, I guess, in their character development in the game. So then we do have um, as part of that accessibility, and again, that is a, that is accessibility within the game itself. Um, then as far as like our team, um, the UX team and IT is responsible, um, not just for like the internal employee experience, but also the player ex experience. And that includes like all of the support that players would receive. So anything that's like outside of the game, um, that is the experience that the that this group is um, responsible for making sure that it is accessible. So making sure that um, there are support options for folks um, who may not be able to um, uh, 
you know, use the some of the support features that are um, provided on the um, EA.com. Um, so exploring different opportunities for them, exploring different opportunities for people to learn about gaming um, from the site itself and getting that support that they need. So it is, it is um, anytime you go to a large company like Electronic Arts, there's the, you, you have to be able to identify like other folks who are also interested in inclusive inclusivity and inclusive products and be able to um, collaborate with them, which is exactly what we do. We collaborate with um, the, the marketing team that is concerned with um, inclusivity in games and accessibility in games. And we all to we um, force multiply um, and work together on all of these different things. Dream work makes the dream work, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> All right, rolling right along here. Uh, this person asked, how can designers make inclusive products in a grassroots approach, i.e. the rest of the organization does not prioritize inclusivity? So uh, this is Natasha. I'm going to try to answer first and Faith, feel free to chime in at any time. Um, we work so that 1% wins count. So knowing what wins you can get in certain areas will do a lot of wonders for you. Because what we want to do here is incremental, but not like, you know, not do something huge that will shake the boat, rock the boat, just because, you know, people are not familiar or are not comfortable with making those a priority doesn't mean that we have to stop. So for us, we work a ton with the um, other groups and also especially with um, ERGs, which is employee resource groups within EA, because there are so much opportunities in there, even if it's, you know, whether it's through their events, whether it's through like creating a product for them or whether it is creating, getting their insight and input into bettering the product that you are responsible for. So I would say figure out what is that small wins that incrementally that you can, um, you know, affect or what is that small change that you can affect and just keep doing at it and build an army of advocates. Cause the more people who believe in your causes, who are able to see the successes that you have, the easier it will be in the long run to, um, to convince people that this is something that we really need to do. This is the right thing to do. Yeah, I would agree with everything Natasha said. And and I, I was really touched by the impact that games have in underrepresented groups' lives. The fact that it can help people who can't travel, travel. The fact that people who may not be able to walk can walk or run or do the things that that they would love to do. The way that people can connect to a larger community. Um, and I just came in with that passion of wanting to, to do more, to make more impact in those people's lives. There's nothing special about me except that um, I got up every day with the desire to move um, this forward. Um, no one is going to ask you to create inclusive products. Um, so you're going to have to do it. Um, everyone out there is going to have to wake up and say, I'm going to do this for me. I'm going to do it because it's right. I'm going to do it because like, this is going to make for a better, uh, a better culture. Um, and so don't wait for someone to ask you, um, you do it yourself and you can absolutely do it yourself. Again, there's nothing special about me except for the fact that I just decided that I was going to do it. And, and that's all that, you know, I made the decision and I just moved on and I figured out how I was going to do it. I love that. That's fantastic. All right. I think we have time for one more quick question here. Um, this person asked, what would you recommend doing when you encounter resistance to accessibility within your organization? 
Do you want to take that first, Faith? Sure. So some of that resistance comes from like, well, I don't want this to be a bottleneck to our lunch, right? And um, and, and, and so I think what happens here is that um, you need to approach it by by um, really looking at roadmaps, creating a roadmap for your team and helping that product person create a roadmap for that product and show how, again, like putting some things in the on that roadmap um, will help achieve a much inc more inclusive product. It doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be binary. And I think a lot of people in product development think of things as binary, where it's either you're going to do it or you're not going to do it. I think that you can make some incremental changes um, and be iterative in that uh, process of development that can help you achieve those goals. Um, so resistance can be uh, resourcing and, and I think showing how you can reach goals without being a bottleneck is super important. And then sometimes resistance can be just um, lack of data and lack of data I've seen really like the ROI. And there is absolutely 100% ROI in making products inclusive, 100%. The more that we make products inclusive, the more people who can use them, the stickier those products will be, and the more loyal those people will be to that brand, 100%. So um, there's no reason why um, we can't partner with product in, in, in ensuring that we get products launched, but we're also thinking about inclusivity. That's really well said, Faith. Um, one of the things that I fall back on whenever I encounter resistance is to put my you know designer and researcher hat on, right? And figure out like, what is it exactly that is causing this resistance? Is that, you know, like Faith says, is it resourcing? Is it lack of data? Is that, you know, they're just afraid that we're going to, you know, assess doing accessibility improvements and all of this is going to be a blocker. So figure out what is it first and then um, experiment. <laughs> Life is just such a big experiment anyway. Like if you try one, it doesn't work. Try something else. It doesn't work. Try, try multiple stuff and see where, you know, what moved the needle, what people are receptive to, because that's essentially what we did. We just kept trying and we just kept figuring out what is it that is people are afraid of, resistant about. And um, if this group kind of resonate with something and then try that with the other group, if that doesn't work, try something else and do that research, that little bit of research of what is it exactly that is, you know, that's causing the resistance will definitely help you. And, and for folks who work um, on enterprise software, um, when you make your product more inclusive, you're creating jobs for underrepresented groups at your company, and you're creating more jobs at other people's companies that use the enterprise software. So, um, you know, it is, it is so important that the work that we do, um, it, it really has a ripple effect. So um, though it may um, seem uh, difficult to kind of um, have to really like kind of shepherd things through, be met with adversity, um, just know that you are creating a ripple in a very large pond that is really going to be impactful in people's lives. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Natasha and Faith, for your excellent presentation today. Um, I know I really enjoyed it. And thank you so much for our attendees and your great questions. Uh, I hope you enjoy the last sessions of AxCon happening in just a few minutes. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.